Hey everybody, welcome back to World History at Home Edition. <laughs> Who knows, I may just record the rest of the semester from here at home. But we're going to be starting our next unit today on World War I. So this is our second to last unit of the semester. So go ahead and get your notes out, follow along, let's get started. So to really kind of get us into some of these events that we're going to be going over, let's talk about some international events that were going on at the time. So in 1896, the first modern Olympic Games was taking place in Athens, Greece. Again, you all know the Olympics take place every four years. Um, this year, here in 2022, at the time of the recording, the Winter Olympics in Beijing are just starting when I'm, rec mm, excuse me, when I'm recording this. Now, in 1899, there was an attempt to bring about universal peace, and there was a conference in Hague to preserve the peace of Europe following the collapse and fall of Napoleon and that peace that had been established. And they came again together in 1907 for the second Universal Peace Conference, this time to talk about naval warfare and projectiles from balloons. Yes, that's right, folks. They were shooting off things from balloons. And they held multiple conferences from 1899 to 1913. Now, there was a very old rivalry, starting in 1871 with uh, the French versus Prussia in the Franco-Prussian War, and France lost land, namely this red region here known as Alsace-Lorraine, which really, if we track that through history, it is constantly changing hands with either Germany or France or Prussia or Austria or who knows what, and there was a very anti-German feeling building up in Western Europe specifically due to that response of France losing that land to what would become Germany itself. So alliances began to draw lines and they were initially intended to promote peace and to discourage attacks. So, and again, due to the placement of my camera, that next one is alliance or a formal agreement to cooperate and come to one another's defense. That bullet point after that is the entente or a non-binding agreement to follow common policies whereas like we all agreed that um, pineapple doesn't belong on pizza oh I'm gonna get canceled for saying that uh-oh but it's a great idea to talk about a non-binding agreement where we all agree to follow those common policies so for the sake of this we're talking about the triple alliance and then the triple entente or as we will called them the uh the uh, this group the central powers and then we'll have the allies which we'll talk about in a minute so to start off with and at least going through this unit there's going to be some abbreviations for the different countries involved so if you see at certain points just a capital letter that's typically referring to a specific country so our triple alliance is made up of germany italy and austria hungary with germany being led by kaiser wilhelm ii and otto von bismarck Italy being led by Vittoria Orlando, and Austria-Hungary being led by Franz Joseph I, and this forming the AKA the Central Powers. Later they'd add the Ottoman Empire to this and Russia, but Italy would back out and not be involved with this towards the latter part of the war. On the flip side, we have the Triple Entente, or the Allies. Now this primarily is France, Great Britain, Russia for the first couple of years of the war till they back out. Um, France being led by Raymond Poncier and George Clemenceau. Great Britain being led by David Lloyd George and Russia being led by Tsar Nicholas II. Now again, like I said, these are the allies. Later they would add Italy, Japan, and the United States and subtract Russia from the mix. But we'll talk about why Russia left the war in a later lecture. So just to give you kind of a map of where everything was falling in for the two sides during World War One, at least at the beginning. So really when we talk about it, there was a lot of rivalries and nationalism that increased this tension. Now, Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire, both members of the Central Powers, were the last of the empires in Europe. And there was a lot of competition, whether that be for land, military resources, or natural resources to build factories. And there was a lot of competitions. Germany was a growing economic and military powerhouse, 
and Russia had a huge population and a bunch of natural resources, which led to the establishment of a lot of colonies or imperialism. We've talked about imperialism before. This is the complete domination of another place for the glorification and extension of a major power. Now, one of the great examples is Morocco, where we saw France and Great Britain fighting Germany for it. And we also have to tie into it militarism, or the glorification of the military, specifically with the navy, between Great Britain and Germany. And journalists would fuel the fire in a form of journalism known as yellow journalism or sensational. Think like uh, tabloids today that blow the simplest of news stories way out of proportion. That was the case here as well. So let's talk about nationalism a little bit more. Mm. So... Germany was very proud of their progress, which they should be, um, and France was still bitter about the loss of land, again, that Alsace-Lorraine border province, which was claimed by both of them. And in Russia, we had a movement of pan-Slavism, or similar languages, in which Russia would then declare themselves the defenders of all Slavic peoples. This includes the Serbia, Serbs in Serbia, the Bosnians, the Croatians, and the Slovenes. Now, the first Slavic nation was Serbia between the Ottoman Empire and Austria-Hungary. And in 1912, with the Balkan Wars versus Turkey, we kind of began to realize that part of Europe was going to become a powder keg, or it was just a matter of time before it exploded. So the powder keg, it, it did ignite. Um, <laughs> so there was an assassination in Sarajevo in Bosnia, home of the Serbs and the Slavs, in which Austria-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie were going through the city as part of a parade, and Austria-Hungary had become viewed as foreign oppressors, and the Black Hand, a Serbian terrorist group, decided, yeah, we're going to kill him. Now, they tried multiple times to kill Ferdinand throughout the day. There was an attempt of a throwing a grenade in the car. It bounced off the car and then killed the would-be assassin by exploding. Um, another gentleman tried to get close enough to stab them. He was stopped by law enforcement. And Princip had thought that, well, we give up. We're not going to get him. And happened to stumble upon him by chance after buying a sandwich. Yes, that's right, folks. He lucked out in front of what was basically the equivalent of a subway. Now, Princip would then proceed to directly shoot Ferdinand and then Sophie, both dying from their injuries and causing a powder keg to become ignited within Austria-Hungary. Because Ferdinand was the heir to the throne. Now, Austria decided to strike back, and they had the unconditional support of their ally, Germany, through the system of entangling alliances, and Serbia got an ultimatum, or a final set of demands, which included submit to complete control, turn over the assassins, and those sorts of things. Serbia did not comply to all these demands, and officially on July 28th of 1914, Austria declared war on Serbia. So with that, came the mess of alliances. Now, Russia and France, through the system of alliances, had agreed to back Serbia. And we have what is known as the Willy and Nikki telegrams. Now, this is direct communication between France and uh, Russia, with Nikki being Tsar Nicholas II. As both sides began to mobilize or prepare their forces for war, Great Britain and Italy adopted a plan of neutrality, or a policy of supporting neither side in the war. They were like, yeah, no, we, we, we don't want to be involved with this. We're going to stay out of it. And with that came Germany's Schlieffen Plan, or a plan to avoid a two-front war. Now, the plan was to go after France first, defeat them quickly, then turn to Russia, who was slow to mobilize. However, they had to invade Belgium, which was a neutral world country, to get to France. But doing so made Britain join the war because Britain was an ally of Belgium. So on August 4th, the Brits now joined the war. Now here's kind of just a general map of how they pushed into France at the beginning of the war. Now the reaction. My goodness, was it a mess. The temporary, it was a lot of temporary relief for international struggles like the labor unrest in Britain and the 1905 revolution in Russia brought about a lot of patriotism. A lot of people saw it as an exciting adventure and a fight for justice and a better world, AKA just like the Avengers. 
So that is it for notes for today. There is no new assignment for today. So I'll see you all next time. Bye, everyone.